See, he's not to be there long term. But he was sent there as my ram in the bush on that particular day, and I accept the ram for that moment. Some of y'all need a backstory on that story. Abraham was sacrificing his son Isaac, went up on a hill, laid him down, was about to kill him because God said there's going to be a sacrifice here today. He went down to kill him, and then he heard something moving over there in the bush, and it was a ram. So he said, wow, God gave me my son back. He picked the son up, took him off the table, took the ram, sacrificed the ram. So what I'm saying is that was my ram in the bush yesterday. I want you to know God has a ram in the bush for your life. He's sending people to believe it, man. Don't you believe it? He's sending people. And when he's sending those people in your life, receive them. You? I'm trying to help somebody. I want you to receive them. Sometimes I have a word for individuals. It could be medical. It could be anything. Something I don't know nothing about. I say the Lord told me to tell you, man. Well, now, how you know? Hey, do what you want to with the information. The Lord told me to give it to you. I'm gone now. I ain't going to argue with you on it. You, you can receive it or reject it. God will give you just what you need when you need it. I want you to know that. And he will be, he will be just what you need when you need him to be that in your life. I needed him to be a mechanic yesterday that could fix those cars. He was that mechanic at that moment, at that hour. And I want you to know that God is going to be what you need him to be when you need him to be. I want you to receive that. I want you to believe that in your life. So he assigned these individuals, Peter, James, and John. And they were gathered under affinity because they were all wild and crazy. Peter was the most spontaneous individual there was recorded in the Bible. It's super spontaneous. But the sons of thunder, James and John, man, there was a close second to Peter. Man, they would fight. Jesus put those individuals together. For this church to grow, it's going to take you doing what you're supposed to do. You doing what God wants you to do. You doing what God wants you to do. You're doing what God wants you to do. See, for the church to grow, we get caught up in the crowd. And that's not what it's about. The vision of City of Faith Church is to have a thousand groups in the next 10 years. A thousand small groups in the next 10 years. A small group is only 10 to 12 people. That's it. That's a small group. And a small group oftentimes may start with two or three people. And you're almost there. But when your group gets to 12, your group is maxed out. And that's your little group. That's your cluster. That's your team. Those are the ones that can get to know you, and you get to know them, and you have some things in common. It may be you're rearing your children together. You ever see sometimes when parents, they have young children, they all kind of hang out together? It's, but you get your group that you hang out with. Y'all might barbecue together. Y'all might ride motorcycles together. Y'all might go to the outlets and go shopping together. I sure don't want to be part of that group. But the different groups. And what you do, God will begin to attract people to the church through you and the group that you have started. That's what the church is about. That's how growth takes place. It's not about getting more people through that door. It's about Jessica starting a small group Jessica has five people that are in this group with her, and they're living life together, and then those five individuals come to church together. That's how it works. Jason has a small group, and that group likes Jason, and they all like to watch uh, certain type of movies and things of that nature, and they all gather together. So he gathered them under in, in affinity. And the other thing, when we look here in this word, he not only gathered them in affinity, and I'm moving fast, he gathered them with affection. Over there in 40, the mama didn't need to be there. Look, look here. And they laughed at him, but he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Why? Man, nothing like a mama, is it? There's nothing like that womb love. Nothing like a daddy either. The daddy has that tomb love. You got tomb love and you got womb love. That tomb love is when a child acts so contrary, <laughs> get all out of their character, you act like a wild person. The only one could go get them is who? Is daddy. And daddy will go in that jungle and, come here, boy. 
But mama loved a baby when the baby ain't but two weeks old, three weeks old, you know, three months old. The mama just has this deep connection with the child. And the daddy oftentimes is a little bit distant because he don't have that womb love. He can't feel it moving. So you need womb love and tomb love on your team. You need someone who will love you unconditionally and encourage you even when you're wrong. But you need somebody on your team who's going to tell you you wrong and you know you're wrong. Now let's make it right. And God will bring these two together. And the great pastor that you want in your life is someone who can encourage you and make you feel good. But you also want a pastor that can make you feel bad so that you can grow and you can develop and you can face your weakness and you can grow through your weakness. And we find ourselves in an age where we think all preachers are supposed to do is make you feel good. And that is certainly not the word of God. That is certainly not how the word of God works. There is a balance to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we keep moving. So we see we're talking about a team. We're talking about a collaborative effort to produce greatness in your life. We're talking about what happens when we come together and we unite together and we move together and we live together and we do amazing things together. And so we start with Jesus. Jesus recruited a team. He not only recruited a team, he re repositioned the team. And last thing, I got to go. The last thing I want you to see he did, and, and this is what he's going to do in your life. He took Peter, James, and John with him. Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John saw things nobody else saw. They saw the transfiguration. Nobody else saw that. Peter, James, and John. When he went into the Garden of Gethsemane, most of the disciples, nine of them, well, eight of them, one of them went there. Eight of them stayed further away. And then three of them went with him. And that was Peter, James, Peter, James, and John. When he went to Jairus' house, there's only three instances in the Bible where Jesus resurrected individuals. There's the window, widow of name, there's Lazarus, and there is Jairus' daughter. Only three saw the miracle of Jairus' daughter. It was Peter, it was James, and, and it, was, it was John. Why did he take them into the inner circle? Why did he take them through something? Why did he put them near death? The Bible said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of, I will fear no. But why did he take them into the shadow of death? Let me stand over there. Why do I have to walk in the shadow of death? Why take me so deep? Why, Lord, let me go through so much? Why, Lord, this challenge in my life, this storm in my life? Because he's developing something in them. And the only way to develop it, they have to go into the inner circle. They have to go into the room with Jairus' daughter. They have to go into this house, into this place of development. There are two things that God wants to do. One thing he wants to do, he wants to make them assignment driven. I told you about that young mechanic. And uh, he, he quit on me twice Saturday. He did. And uh, so first time, he was uh, trying to put some brakes on the, the back of a car, just stand the brakes. He said, I can't do it. I can't do it. I looked at him. I said, okay, I'll, I'll work it out. So then, I don't know how much you know about cars. You know, it's pretty easy to take a rotor off. You just put it on, you just take it off. So he had everything off, and he could get the rotor off. He said, I cannot do it. I said, listen. You better get that road off. I'm not going to let you quit this time. You figure out how to get it done. You get it done, come back. Well, a few minutes later, he had that road off. So God puts us in a situation with rusty brakes. He puts us in a situation with rotors that don't want to come off because he wants us to understand that we are to be assignment-driven. 